Well, church, what a joy it is to be worshiping together with you all. Let's go ahead, open up to Acts 11. Acts chapter 11, uh, starting at verse 19 and going to verse 30. Acts 11, 19 to 30. If you do not have a copy of God's word, put your hand up nice and high. Our ushers are coming forward right now. We want to put a copy of the Bible in your lap. And if you do not have a copy of God's word at home, then please Keep that as a free gift, as our way of encouraging you to continue to do a deep dive in God's word every day. You will never regret it. And our text tonight is on page 536 of those Bibles that were just handed out. 536. The title of our message tonight is Stronger Together. Everyone say that with me. Stronger Together. Yeah, it even sounds stronger when you say it together, huh? Stronger together. Here's the truth we need to understand. By God's design, by God's design, not man's design, but by God's design, the church is better. The church is stronger together. Churches, Christians, are not meant to operate as silos. And we see all through the New Testament and central to the book of Acts, we see that God's plan for the church is to be partnered together on mission. This is the, known as the doctrine of interdependence. Is that one you hear very much? Doctrine of independence? Put your hand up if you heard of the doctrine of interdependence before. That's sad. And it's no wonder, especially the church in North America is pursuing this individualistic competitive spirit with one another. It's the doctrine of interdependence. I love how the president of Great Commission Collective, Dave Harvey, put it this way, whose book inspired the title for this message. You'll see it on the screen. He says this. Churches achieve together what no one church could accomplish alone. That is so right. Churches achieve together by the power of God in their midst what no one church could ever accomplish on its own. Do you believe that? Welcome to the doctrine of interdependence. There is more kingdom expansion There is more glory of God revealed. There is more gospel proclamation. There are more lives saved and transformed by the gospel. There are more churches matured and equipped. There are more churches planted. There is more sin defeated. There is more mission faithfulness. Why? Because the church is better, say it, together. The church is better together by God's design. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. And our little straw pole there of hands going up reveals it. Problem is unbelief. That we are truly better, truly stronger together. Individually, as we strive together here in the local church right here, side by side for the gospel, we're not living in silos. But then also church to church. Church to church. We don't believe that, otherwise we'd see way, 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 way more of it. And we'd have the missional mindset in our lives to prove it. See, we may say we believe it with our mouths. We've got the theology maybe down, but our actions show apathy and unwillingness to count the cost to do so. And what's the result? We see it all over the place. Partiality instead of acceptance individualism instead of community, consumerism instead of service, isolation instead of partnership, competition instead of collaboration. You don't think that's plaguing the church today? Going for the same piece of the Christian pie? Inward focus instead of a kingdom mindset? and a mission hindrance instead of mission fulfillment. And here's what we're going to see tonight from Acts chapter 11 by God's design. 
if we're not willing to stand together, we're standing in God's way on mission. Just go back to 11, verse 17, and you'll see that. If we're not willing to stand together on mission, we're standing in God's way in the mission. The only way we see God's mission fulfilled through his church as he intends, the only way we see the lives God desires to save, the church he desires to build, is if we do it together in his power. Here's the big idea for the tech. Please write this down. This is going to be land groundbreaking message tonight. Let's go. Love seeing your heads go down. Pens ready. Let's go. Big idea. To be faithful on mission, the church must partner together in mission. To be faithful on mission, the church, big, notice the big C. That's intentional. This isn't just one little local church. It's the big C, the universal church, must partner together on mission. And let's get some context for our text of where what brings us to Antioch tonight. Chapter 11, verses 1 to 18, if you remember and you listened to last week's message, Peter has just given the Jerusalem church an update on how God had poured out his spirit on the Gentiles and made it clear that salvation was not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles, the non-Jews as well. He made it clear, there is no partiality. Here's another way to put that in today's lingo. There's no tribalism. There's only one tribe in the family of God. I'm gonna say that again. That's a good spot for an amen. Someone over here did it, way to go. There's no tribalism in the family of God. There's only one tribe. Okay, let's try it again. (laughs) There's only one tribe in the family of God. Thank you. There we go. A little wake up. Now the juices are flowing. This is good. And all those things that were such a source of division previously between Jews and Gentiles, the food laws, the clothing laws, the holy days, circumcision, all of those things now overcome, fulfilled in Jesus Christ and the church from all tribes, tongues, nations, beautiful, was to be united in him. Peter reports this to the church, and after initially criticizing him for his association with the Gentiles, the Jerusalem church affirms the work of God after hearing the testimony of God's work and the inclusion of the Gentiles after hearing Peter's report. And the church in Jerusalem, as we're going to see, Lord willing, next year in Acts 15, when we get to the final part of the book of Acts, the Jerusalem church, they still had lots to figure out about how this relationship's going to work. There's been decades of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And all of a sudden, they've just all been upended. So they got lots to figure out. But the crucial first step, if the church was to partner together on mission in being Jesus' witnesses to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8, this was the first step. And this was a massive, crucial moment for the church. Verse 18, 11.18, Right there. Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. And now that brings us to Acts 19 to 30, our text today. And the focus shifts. Focus shifts. I love how the Holy Spirit does this through the, through the writer Luke. Focus shifts from the church in Jerusalem to the church in a place called Antioch. I love the Antioch church. Okay, there should be a map. There should be a map. Jesse, you got a picture of Antioch there? Okay, there's Jerusalem on the bottom. It's circled. Antioch is about 300, get this, 300 miles north of Jerusalem. Okay, it's in Syria. So Antioch is actually the capital of Syria. You'll see this on the screen. We got to get our background if we're going to understand the magnitude of what's about to happen. 300 miles north, capital of Syria. It is the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Why? Because Antioch was a major port city. A major port city. And so you had people from all nations coming to Antioch. It's like this big crossroads. You have people literally coming from everywhere. Oh, wait a sec. Does that remind us of a city that we live in? Yes. One of my favorite things to do with my wife on my day off, sometimes we'll do this when we go downtown. We'll go to like where the embassies are and just take a little selfie. We went to France today. Woohoo! 
like, that, that's so cool. It makes everybody jealous. But here's the thing. Like, like, we love that. But the Lord has literally brought the nations here, just like in Antioch. But here's what happens when all the nations come together. Like we see in Antioch and here today. It's religiously pluralistic. It's filled, just filled, saturated with paganism. Paganism. In fact, in Antioch, there was an entire island, a whole island just devoted to the temples of gods. A whole island. Just devoted to different temples of different gods. There was a basilica devoted to cults and cult prostitution. There was a massive pantheon of gods, Zeus, Apollos, you name it. And so look at the contrast from verse 18 to 19. You got the Jerusalem church on one end. This is, these are your conservative brothers and sisters. And then look how the Holy Spirit flips the script and gets to Antioch in 19. If the Jerusalem church was considered the right wing, the conservative ones, Antioch was definitely the liberal brothers and sisters. Right? Like it, you couldn't get a bigger contrast. Between the two, I just love this. And it is here in the misfits of Antioch that God uses as the launching pad, oh, I love this, watch this, for international missions and church planting all around the world. Antioch is the first international local church made up of Jews and Gentiles. It's the first one. It's the first international local church. It's the first Gentile church plant. Antioch. Amazing. Amazing. And through it, we see the power of the gospel overcoming the darkness as the Lord teaches his church how they must partner together to be faithful. He teaches them true, two critical truths that they had to learn and that we must, as the church of Jesus Christ, learn today and hold fast to by faith in God's power if we are to see the Lord build his church and expand his kingdom as he intends in us and through us. You ready to go? Let's take a trip to Antioch. Bible's up. Let's stand to honor the authority of God's word. We're going to read this together nice and loud. Acts chapter 11, verses 19. We're just going to go to verse 21, up to and including it. Ready? Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, all God's people said. Amen. You may be seated. So, so blessed to hear us reading scripture together. Can't wait for heaven, huh? That's gonna be amazing. Come on. All right. To be partnered on mission. First thing we see is this. First three verses we just read. We must declare one message. If we're going to be faithfully partnered on mission with other churches, other believers, it starts right here. We must declare only one message. You'll see it here. Faithful partnership depends on pure gospel conviction. Not a distorted gospel, the true gospel. A pure gospel conviction. Challenge for you and I tonight is this. Are you living with that conviction? A gospel conviction. We saw in the text we just read, it said here, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen... That brings us back to Acts 6 and 7 when that happened, that persecution. Stephen, if you remember, he's a devoted follower of Christ and he was persecuted in Jerusalem for proclaiming Jesus Christ in front of the Jewish leaders. He was actually the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And the result of his persecution, you see it right here in the text, most Christians, except the apostles, they fled Jerusalem and in verse 19, we see where God scattered them. Now, circle the word scattered. If you remember from that sermon, the word scattered actually means sowed. So here's God in his sovereignty, sowing the church 300 miles away from Jerusalem. He's scattering them, sowing them throughout different places. See, God allowed the heat 
God does this. He's like, okay, you're getting comfy in Jerusalem. You just want to kind of stay there. Don't forget, I give you a mission, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. You can't just stay in Jerusalem. So here's what God does as a loving father will do. He will turn up the heat on the church. He turns up the heat so the church would get turned out. And maybe that's a word for someone in this room tonight. God's turning up the heat on you. It's not to destroy you. It's to deliver you. He loves you. He's a loving father. And because he's good, he can only act good towards his children. Otherwise, it's against his nature. Because he is love, he can only act out of love towards his children, even by allowing hard things into their lives. You say, but if you love me, why would you do this? He's going to turn the heat up so you'll be turned out and he can do and complete the work he started in you which is exactly what you and I would want if we knew what God knows. Because he's a loving father. Turns up the heat so the church get turns out. They were just getting real comfy keeping to themselves. Hey, is that us today? We're getting really comfy just keeping to ourselves? Knowing everybody. So nice. The heat's coming. Don't let that apathy set in, church. Stay fervent. Stay expectant. Say, Lord, give me courage to witness today. See, and ultimately, God in his sovereignty is using the persecution against the church to build the church to the ends of the earth. Where is he doing it? Well, you see right here, right out of the text, verse 19, go back to the text, you'll see a map on the screen. Phoenicia, which is modern-day Lebanon, it's a coastal region that included Tyre and Sidon. Cyprus, which is an island right there, circled there, 100 miles off the coast, and then, of course, Antioch. Now, I want you to notice the missional mindset of the church, the believers. Even though they fled persecution, It didn't stop the Jewish Christians from continuing to preach the gospel to, who were they preaching to in verse 19? To the Jews. They said, no one but the Jews. There was a Jewish population in Antioch, and obviously, as we see in verse 19b, they're only preaching the Jews. They didn't get the memo about Cornelius. They didn't get the memo about what just happened with the Gentiles yet. But that's not all. Keep going. Verse 20. Notice what it says. Eyes in the book. Some Jewish Christians from Cyrene. Cyrene is North Africa. And Cyprus were declaring the gospel too. Only they crossed. Notice what these believers did. Awesome. And I pray we would never, ever hesitate to do this. They crossed a major cultural barrier. Do you see what they did? You got one group of the church just preaching to Jews. Now you've got these believers from Cyrene and Cyprus. They're crossing the cultural barrier. And who are they preaching to? Just go to the text. They're declaring it to the Hellenists. Now these are not the same Hellenists as in Acts 6.1. They're not Greek-speaking Jews. These are Greek-speaking non-Jews. They're Gentiles. Cultural barrier crossed. Who has God put in your life that that cultural barrier needs to be crossed? Loved ones. Imagine what would happen if they weren't willing to do it. What they would have missed. And God would have raised up someone else. And what's the result of them? Verse 21, the hand. They're preaching one message. The hand, that is the presence and power and protection of the Lord was on them. As he empowered their preaching in an answer of their humble, desperate, and dependent cries for him to do so. He empowered the preaching and a great number of people, Jews and Gentiles, believed, repented of sin and confessed Jesus as Lord. Okay, live in the text. You've got two different people groups that are being ministered to, Jews and Gentiles. You've got believers from different nations gathering together. They didn't look the same. They didn't sound the same. And you've got these believers preaching to different audiences in different contexts But notice what happened. The church partnered together, expanding its reach and watching God expand his kingdom by declaring one message. 
No matter who was declaring it, no matter who they were declaring it to, no matter where those people came from, it was one message. They're not declaring their own opinions. They're not distorting God's message to make it culturally acceptable. They're not declaring a different so-called gospel. And we see right here in verses 19 to 21, the true gospel that is essential for all faithful partnership. Imagine if you had one group of believers declaring the true gospel, then you had another group of believers declaring a false one. Would that church be being built? No, there would not be unity in the church. One message, the true gospel, loved ones, is essential for faithful partnership. If the quote-unquote church, if they're not declaring the true gospel, I'm wondering if they're a church. Let's just put that out on the, out on the table. But if the so-called church or organization, what we would call parachurch ministries today, if they are not declaring the true gospel, we cannot partner with them. Hands down. And we see it so clearly right here. And we're going to see it clearly again in a moment. Why? Because the gospel, the pure gospel, the undefiled gospel is our foundation. We have nothing to partner on if it's not central. The pure gospel, not just people who say, yeah, I totally believe in Jesus. Okay, you're good. Be discerning. As elders, when there's opportunity for partnership, when people come to us, we need to carefully weigh that out and take our time to discern. Because not everyone who says they believe and live out the true gospel does. And it's a way we protect this church from division. Because we love you. And in fact, Paul makes this so clear. Galatians 1.8, you'll see it on the screen. If you don't think it's a big deal, you say, what's the big deal? They both say they believe in Jesus. Really, really? Here's the big deal. Acts 1.8, you'll see it on the screen. Paul says, but even if we or an angel from heaven, pull in a little more rank than you and I, even an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, the pure gospel, the true gospel. Notice what it says. Let what? Let him be accursed. The Greek word for accursed means anathema. It means let them be devoted to eternal destruction in hell. You think it's a big deal to God that his church be partnered on the true gospel? You bet it is. Sure, look different. Sure, sound different. Sure, don't divide over that stuff, but preach the one message. Preach the one message. That's a sobering word right there. See, this is the one message Christ gave his church to proclaim. It is the one message that ultimately fulfills the great commission by the power of the Holy Spirit that the hand of the Lord will be upon as it is proclaimed. It is the one message and the one that all faithful partnership depends on, the pure gospel. You say, what is the pure gospel? There's so much distortion. Get ready, get ready, tune in. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lord of all, came to earth, left perfection in heaven, and came to earth as fully man and fully God. Two distinct natures, yet working in perfect unity. Two distinct natures. Fully God-man, lived a perfect life for 33 years with no sin, conceived by the Holy Spirit through the Virgin Mary. Perfect life for 33 years did not sin once, and he went to the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and mine, the very sin that separates us from God, and that we needed a Savior to deliver us from. And he died on that cross, and he rose again, defeating the power of sin and death as the curse of sin that is on you and I without him was placed on him. As 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, he who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, never sinned once, became sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that when God sees us, if we have repented of our sin and trusted in Jesus as Lord, saying, I can't be the savior of my own life. I can never be good enough. I can never be successful enough. There is no other God that can deliver me. I don't care what name they hold. There is one name that is above every name. And that is the name of Jesus Christ. And maybe some of us in this room right now are believing a distorted gospel. 
believing that the name of another God is going to deliver you. It won't. Maybe some of us are believing a distorted gospel and saying, well, well, I'm the focus of my own life. God's job is to bless me and make me prosperous. That's a false gospel that leads straight to hell. There is one pure gospel and it's not up for debate. It's not up for debate. And Jesus died and rose again feeding the power of sin and death and now offers forgiveness and peace with God for all who like the people in Antioch repent of that sin and surrender to him as Lord and Savior. Have you done it? There's one message, one pure God. I don't care what this world tries to throw at you to distort that. I don't care what the critics are gonna say. I care about and we should care about what God says. He says, I gave you one message. There's one way, one truth, and one life. And no one comes to the Father but through my Son, Jesus. Faithful partnership depends on a unified gospel conviction. We see it right here in Antioch. Despite their differences, the unified gospel conviction in both proclamation and application. Hey, brothers and sisters, if you made that decision to follow Christ, are you, like the brothers and sisters all over the world, what we see right here in our family history in Antioch, are you working together in asking the Lord to empower you to declare this one message that Jesus has entrusted us with across our cultural differences, across our different skin colors, across our different languages, across our different ages, across our different generations and life stages, Are you working together, loved ones, on mission to declare this gospel in your workplace, in your homes, around your tables, on the bus, in the locker room, in your small groups, preaching it to one another without partiality? Are you you willing to go and are you going to the unlikeliest of places, Antioch, to proclaim it to the most unlikeliest of people to receive it? See, this church, Hope Ottawa, is committed to this. As elders, this is our commitment. We are committed to this. Pray for us. It's not easy with the pressure that comes against us. Pray for us. Pray for this church. We are committed to this because we have nothing without it. And you may say this. You may say, I'm scared to declare this. Can, can I just, you're like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a Saul. I'm not a, I'm not a Peter. I'm not a Philip. I'm just me. Can I, can I just ask you a question? Who are these people declaring the word? Go back. Go back and tell me a name in the church in Antioch. Who's the pastor? Who are the small group leaders? Who is anyone in the church? Just go ahead. Read. 19 to 21. See if you can find one. We have no idea. You know how that church in Antioch is described? As those and them. You content to be a those or them? Are you out to make a name for yourself? The hand of the Lord is on the those and thems. Not on the one who's like, look at me. There's no big celebrity culture in Antioch. We don't know of any podcasts or book sales. We don't know of any celebrity culture here. We don't know of anyone striving for platform or prominence. Here's what we need to understand. This, these are ordinary people in the hands of an extraordinary God filled with gospel conviction. And this is a challenge for you and I. How many of us today, right here in this room, watching online, love you, miss you, come here soon. How many of us today are just standing in God's way, as we go back to verse 17 in Acts 11, standing in God's way because we're pursuing a platform We're pursuing prominence. And we're not content to be a those or them. This world will say, pursue the platform, won't it? Not God. I pray that increasingly our prayer with this simple little prayer came to mind in final review to encourage you to write this down. Lord, help me to be content to be 
one of them. Just help me to be content today, whether no one else sees how I'm serving you, but you. Help me to be content to be one of them. Hey, moms, I just want to encourage you. You might feel like a lot of the work that you do goes unnoticed and unappreciated, and perhaps it does, and you don't get any thank yous. But I want to tell you, there's one who's very attentive to your work. Are you content to be of those and them? and leave it in the hands of God. And if you're here and you've never confessed Christ as your Savior, as you hear that gospel declared, here's your challenge. Here's the command of God for your life. This is a command of God for your life. As he makes clear in his word, will you hear the gospel declared And like the people in Antioch and people all over this room and all over this world, will you respond in repentance? That is turning from your sin and turning to the Lord, saying, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. You are the only Savior, and I surrender my life to you right now. He can do that, and you will have new life in him. That's a command of the Lord for you. Will you hear it and respond? To be partnered on mission, we must declare one message. And from this last point today, Pens are ready. Here we go. We must engage one mission. If we're going to be partnered on mission, we must engage only one mission and not be distracted from it. Faithful partnership depends on great commission conviction. Question, are you living with it, loved one? Will you live with it? Look at verse 22. Keep going. So good. Back to the text. Verse 22. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas. Hey, Barnabas is back. I love Barnabas. I hear Barnabas. I'm like, I'm all in. I want to know what he's doing. Barnabas is back. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it is. Upon hearing about the spiritual awakening that is happening in Antioch, the Jerusalem church, don't forget, it's like the, the mother church, if you will, at this time. He sends out Barnabas to do what? Validate God's work. Like they sent Peter and John in Acts 8 with the Samaritans. Now they're sending Barnabas. You can just go make sure what's really happening is legit. And recall, Barnabas in Acts 4 and Acts 9, he's known as the son of encouragement and he's from Cyprus. What a great wise move of God. Who are we going to send? A guy to throw cold water on what's happening or the son of encouragement? Yeah, we're sending the encourager. Get him going. And not only that, they knew Barnabas' background matched the background of the church. The son of encouragement from Cyprus to a church filled with Cypriots. Amazing. And when Barnabas, notice the text, he arrives in Antioch, he sees what's happening. We see three fruits of missional conviction that he lived with and that this church in Antioch lived with, that both he and them displayed that we must increasingly pray for and possess by God's power if we are to be faithful and partnering on mission with other believers and churches in the city, around the world, in fulfilling the Great Commission. Okay, ready? Pens up. Here we go. The life of commission conviction. The life that is filled with commission conviction is a life of, first one, humble encouragement. Humble encouragement. Go to verses 23, 24. Back to the text. Eyes in. When he, that is Barnabas, came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Why did he do that? Verse 24 tells us, go back to the text, for he was a good man. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. See, upon seeing God's gracious work in Antioch, Barnabas is glad. Circle glad in your Bibles. It means Barnabas rejoiced. No wonder, because he's filled with the Spirit. And when you see the work of God in his church, if you are filled with the Spirit, that's your response. If you are keeping in step with the Spirit at that moment, that's your response. You rejoice. And he exhorted. Notice what he did as a result of that. Keep going in the text. He exhorted. That means he encouraged the believers to do what? Remain 
faithful. Remain faithful there. Remain means to abide. Out of all the things Barnabas could have encouraged him with, huh? Talk about biblical encouragement. Abide. Stay close to the Lord. Stay in intimacy with Jesus. Greatest encouragement you can give another brother or sister. Stay close to the Lord. Not your opinion. Not anything else. Stay close to the Lord and abide. And be steadfast and resolute on mission. No distractions, Antioch Church. Question, where are you and I distracted from the mission today? Where are we not steadfast and resolute on mission? Because our mission has gone from the conviction of the commission conviction to my personal agenda conviction. Where are you distracted from the one mission we have as a church? Just write it down. Get before the Lord. Not sure? Ask him. He'll show you because he wants that for you. Now notice, even though the believers dressed differently, did things a bit different than the Jerusalem church, would you agree? Would you agree? Uh Uh-huh. But they still kept the pure gospel central. Barnabas didn't try to conform the Antioch believers to the preferences of the Jerusalem church. And he didn't quench the spirit. He didn't come with a spirit of competition. Well, you know, in Jerusalem, you know, we're doing this. And we've got this. And it's bigger. And it's this. And it's, you see it in there? There's no spirit of competition. It's like, well, our preachers are a little more seasoned over here than you are. Really? Notice what he did. Because he's filled with the spirit and not filled with himself. Let that word just sit on our hearts for a moment. You filled with the Spirit or filled with yourself? Lord, help us. I'm right there with you. Lord, help us. He didn't try to conform the Antioch believers to the preference of the church and quench the Spirit. He didn't come with a spirit of competition, try to demean what God was doing to prop himself up. He humbly celebrated God's work in their lives. Oh, He displayed a kingdom mindset of no partiality. The pure gospel and a commission conviction. Let's cheer that on. He rejoiced in the work of the gospel, even though there were many differences between this church and his in Jerusalem. This is why in verse 24 it says, Barnabas was a good man, filled with the spirit, humble. (sighs) Biblical encouragement is a fruit of the spirit. Hey, question. Who has God put around you that needs some biblical encouragement today? And you say, well, I don't know. Does it matter if you need to know they need it or not? Just go and give it. Never, ever, 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 ever. Did I say ever? Never, ever fall into the trap of believing someone is beyond the need for encouragement. Even right now, that person sitting beside you, man, we get really good at this, eh? We come to a service, we package ourselves up. Yeah, how you doing? Oh, yeah, good, good, good. Meanwhile, your life's falling apart. (laughs) Happens all the time. Church is not supposed to be a masquerade party, loved ones. We're family. Are we willing to step in? Send that mom a note of encouragement. Send that dad. Send that single person. Say, thank you. This is what I see God doing. Bless you. Never underestimate a person's need for encouragement. Let's be Barnabases all over this place. Because what's the result of his encouragement? Go to verse 24. Go back. Love the heads down. Love it. Gospel multiplication is the result. Of course it is. Great many people are added to the Lord. That's where humble encouragement leads. Keep going, guys. Keep going. All right, next one. A life of commission conviction. Number one is a life of humble encouragement. Number two, it's a life of intentional equipping. Intentional equipping. Look at 24 to 20, or 25 to 26. Back to the text. So Barnabas, after he exhorts them, after he sees all these people coming to the Lord, he's like, oh, oh, I've got an issue. A good issue, but an issue. Look at verse 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. He's like, man, I need some help. I need some help here. And when he had found him, verse 26, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, love this, the disciples were first called Christians. 
See, in response to the increasing numbers of believers coming to Christ, Barnabas knew he needed some help to lead them. How, is this not mark of a, humi- of a humble heart? I can't do it. I'm not gonna try to rob the platform. As the leader, I'm not gonna try to be a ball hog. I need help. How many of us are just even right now unwilling to say those three words and we're gripped in whatever's holding us back? We won't say, I need help because, oh, then I'll be judged. And and then Barnabas is like, guys, there's so many, I can't handle this. I need help. I gotta go get Saul. Now, interesting thing about Saul. (laughs) He heads off to Tarsus to get him. You remember who Saul is? Saul was the very person whose persecution of these Christians led the believers to come to Antioch in the first place. Everyone say awkward. He's like, I gotta go get Saul. And they're like, wait a second, Did did you say Saul? We're here because of Saul. What are you doing going to get Saul? Oh, that's amazing. Remember, these are just normal people. Remember, this is historical narrative, which means this actually happened. It's like the guy who killed my neighbor. Is, you're going to go get him? Can't you go get like John? Please. He goes to get Saul. And they hadn't seen Saul since the persecution. That was their last memory of Saul, 10 years ago, 10 years. Recall after Saul, in Acts 9, after Saul had fled from Jerusalem after his conversion, the Jews wanted to kill him for preaching the gospel, he went to Tarsus, that was his hometown, and he spent the last, he had spent the last eight years there ministering. Now, can I just do a side point for a moment? This is a very important truth we need to emphasize here about that, why context is so important, loved ones. Because today, so many people want the platform of Saul. They want the platform of Paul without the preparation of God for Paul. Paul has been sidelined for eight years. Not sidelined from God's purpose, but during these eight years, notice what God's doing. It's God's preparation process. He's been out of the picture for eight years. God has been equipping, disciplining, training, forging his character and his competency to be the church planter and missionary God is calling him to be. And then notice, at the right time, everyone say the right time is God's time. It's not my time. Y'all didn't say the last part very loud. Yeah, okay, Uh, you sit with the Lord on that. (laughs) At God's time, notice this, God opened the door for Saul to get to Antioch. There's nothing in the book about Saul pushing, oh, something's going on in, I wanna get there because I wanna get to the prestigious position again. Nothing. God gave Saul an open heart and then God brought the open door. Why are you trying to push open a door that God's not letting you go through yet? Would you stop, please? Saul was faithful right where he was, undergoing the instruction and training of the Lord. Are you willing to do that? Right where God has you. Saul stayed committed to the mission wherever God put him and whenever. And now... Saul comes back to Antioch with Barnabas. He spends an entire, notice the text, he spends an entire year teaching, instructing, and equipping the Christians there in the word of God for the work of ministry because now Saul was prepared to do that. He had no idea it was coming. Building up the church and the fulfillment of the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Go back to the book. Notice verse 26. God used Barnabas and Saul's efforts so fruitfully. Open heart meets open door. Prepared heart meets open door. That unbelievers in Antioch, steeped in paganism, notice such a difference. Notice verse 26. Notice such a difference in the believers that they gave them the name Christians. Notice the church didn't call, read the text. The church didn't call themselves Christians. And you might say, what about the original language? In the original language, it doesn't say it either. They didn't call themselves Christians. 
the unbelieving community called them Christians. You know what Christian means? The party of the Christ. The Christ follower. Because it was so evident whose they were. By their declaration with their mouths. The one message. And the demonstration with their lives. Oh, Lord, raise up a generation of the Christ party that every unbeliever would know that person must be a Christian. You want to see it, church? Same God. It can happen today. God hasn't changed. There was no denying it. See, the missional collaboration between believers and churches flowed from a unified missional conviction. The believers had one mission mindset. It wasn't how they personally could get ahead. That wasn't their mission. It wasn't to claim a title. That wasn't their mission. It wasn't to rise to the top, but through humble, intentional equipping, devoted themselves to building one another up to see the church strengthened and God glorified. And that all led to this. Missional conviction seen through number three, the life of missional conviction, write this down, is a life of radical generosity. Radical generosity. Generosity. Look at 27 to 30 as we close out. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and, and foretold by the Spirit there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And, immediately, or, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of of Barnabas and Saul. See, during that year that Saul and Barnabas are teaching, equipping the disciples, a prophet named Agabus, we're gonna see him again in Acts 21, verse 10. He comes down from Jerusalem. Now recall, you say prophets and prophecy, recall this, Ephesians 2, 20 and Ephesians 4, 11, God used apostles and prophets to lay the blueprint and foundation of the church through writing of scripture and preaching of it. You say, well, I was telling you about a, a famine writing of scripture. Uh, is it in the Bible? It was scripture. We just read about it. Okay. To write scripture, foundation of the church. And once scripture was written, this office, the apostles and the prophets ended. Ended. And now, Agabus, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesies a major famine coming in Jerusalem all over the world. Now, this was the Roman Empire, known world at the time. And we know a famine like this occurred in 45 to 46 AD. And you see in the text, during the reign of Emperor Claudius. Now, notice in verses 29 to 30, as the believers in Antioch hear the news that this is going to happen, notice what they immediately do. Radical, immediate generosity. They determine or resolve. I love that word determine. It's so good. They immediately determine and resolve to support the church in Jerusalem who is poor and would need help. Notice the church in Antioch, they didn't think twice about it. They didn't think twice about it. They didn't wait. They're like, oh, fam oh our temptation in our flesh would be like, famine's coming. Well, I better hold my own and, and just see the impact it has on me. I got to make sure. Like, I, I just got to hold my If that's coming, I just, I got to put it away. I can't give it. I can't be generous. No, no, no. Notice this. They didn't wait till they were in a better financial position. Or they didn't just, well, let's just wait out the famine and see how it goes and we'll give from our abundance of leftover. They didn't do that, did they? Everyone say, no, they didn't. They didn't even, and here's the thing. Isn't it easier to, to be generous with people that we know intimately? They didn't know the church in Jerusalem. They were 300 miles away in another country. They didn't know them. It didn't matter. Do you know why? Because they were family. They were family. That's what mattered. They were family. It wasn't a, well, you do for me and I'll do for you. They were family. That was enough. Is it enough for you and I? I 
they knew the church belonged to Jesus and their family, their brothers and sisters had a need. And notice the text, each believer gave joyfully, generously and sacrificially, even in the face of a famine. It's not like the Antioch church was loaded. Even in the face of a famine that would cripple the economy, they gave. As much, notice how much they gave. I love the Spirit's inspiration here. They gave as much, notice the text, as they were able. That means everything they could give, they did. It wasn't like, well, I'll give this much, but I want my Starbucks latte the next day, so I can't give that. They gave everything they could because they were family. And their brothers and sisters had a need. Now, how? Verse 30, how did they give? They were wise in their giving. They had accountability in their giving. What'd they do? They gave it to Barnabas and Saul, the leaders, the trusted leaders of the church, to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem because they knew the elders knew what the needs were. And they didn't notice, they didn't earmark their giving to be like, well, as long as you, I'll give, but as long as you give it to this person. Didn't it? None of that. It's like, there's a need, here you go. You are given as a gift by the Lord. We trust in the Lord. We trust in you. Whatever the need is, whoever it's with, with whatever they could. Jews, Gentiles standing in solidarity. What a beautiful picture of heaven. No wonder, everyone is. No wonder it was here in Antioch they were first called Christians. No wonder. Jesus says in John 13, 34 to 35, a new commandment I give to you, church, that you love one another. You're a family. Love one another. Just as I have loved you. You know how Jesus loved us? He gave everything for us. You also are to love one another. By this, all people, notice this. It's not by your flashy performances. It's not by your eloquent rhetoric that people will know that you're mine. Look at this. By this, sacrificial love, giving of our time, giving of our talents, giving of our treasures, they will know. The unbelieving world will know, just like they did in Antioch, that you are mine. You're of the Christ party. It makes no sense otherwise why you'd live that way. In the face of a famine, in the face of a crumbling economy, it makes no sense. If you have love for one another. Today, church, the Lord has opened the door for us to partner in different ways with churches and partner with each other here at Hope Ottawa, individually and as families, unified in both gospel proclamation and missional convictions. And as a church, we have opportunities both here in Canada and around the world. If you're wondering about the fellowship of churches we're a part of, go to gccollective.org. You'll see all the work of the Lord around this world. What he's doing is we partner together on mission, gospel conviction, great commission conviction, all together. Well, just under 200 churches now on mission around this world. But also here at home in Samaria, Judea, Heritage Bible, or Heritage College and Seminary. Go ahead, look on the website. You'll see all that they're doing to see church planters and churches planted and church strengthened across the nation and the world. Power to change and more possibly coming as we're seeking the Lord on that. And the Lord has entrusted us individually and corporately with so much. And hear, hear the word of the Lord today. To whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, much is required. Faithful partnership depends on great commission conviction. Are you, will you live with it? Will you live with it? Or are we more focused on our sports cars, padding our, our RSPs? Yes, be wise, be wise, but be radically generous. Just look at this list again. Are you living with this? Right there, which one? or more than one. Ask yourself the question, ask the Holy Spirit, are you living with a humble encouragement of your brothers and sisters around you? Are you glad, here's, here's an indicator, are you glad and rejoicing when you see the grace of God towards them, what he gave them in that provision, 
that he supplied. Maybe that relationship. Maybe you're longing for a spouse and you see a friend get a spouse. Can you, in that moment, see the grace of God and be glad? Or are you on a different mission? How about, how about, how about in the service opportunity that that person gets that you want? Can you see them up there? Can you see them doing that and be glad at God's grace towards them? Or is your mission about you in that moment? What is it? How about us as a church with church size? Man, we tend to make church size the main marker of God's faithfulness to a church. Really? Really? Not according to God's word. But can we look at another church when God blesses them in certain ways? Can can we look and be like really glad that they're proclaiming the gospel and more and more people are hearing about it? God brought a revival to, to Ottawa, but he used a different church to start it. Can we celebrate that? I sure hope so. I sure hope so. Loved ones, repent of where our arrogance is. That's blocking out humble encouragement. Here's another one. Are you living a life of intentional equipping? Intentional investment in the lives of brothers and sisters. Here's a big burden on my heart and us as a church. Next week's family day long weekend. I'm going to, Lord willing, be preaching from Psalm 78, 1 to 8. Read the text in advance. Let it saturate your heart. On the discipleship of families and children. These families and children need mentors. They need encouragement. Have you stepped into Hope Kids? Have you applied for Hope Youth? It's right on our doorstep. Intentionally equipping. How about in our small groups with one another? Are you making that a priority? Or are you cutting out on small groups when you have an opportunity to intentionally equip your brothers and sisters in Christ? Or is that just not an option for you? When you get around to it, maybe. What is that, loved ones? And as a church, as God opens doors for more of this here locally, nationally, internationally, are we willing to come alongside other churches and other gospel-centered organizations? GCC EU is talking to Pastor Marius this week, going to roll out more of that in the coming months. How about with people you've never met, training and equipping them in soul care, kids, youth, you know, elder training, preaching, teaching. Are we willing to go if the Lord opens doors? Is an open heart going to meet an open door there? Are we ready? Are we just holding our own? How about this? Radical generosity. Giving provision to the church to see its needs met. The church built up. Lives changed for the glory of God. Whoever, wherever, with whatever, but together. Amen? See, when you give to Hope Ottawa, you actually are giving through Hope Ottawa. You have to have a missional mindset. You're actually giving through Hope Ottawa. We're not keeping things to ourselves here. That's not our mission. It's to give through. Remember, loved ones, churches achieve together what no church, not one church, could achieve alone. One more time. To be faithful in mission, the church must partner together in mission, declaring one message, gospel conviction, and engaging one mission, commission conviction. Is this, is this, is this not how Jesus lived perfectly as the faithful witness for 33 years on earth? Right there. Be encouraged. He hasn't just given us the mission. He's given us the means to do it in his power, for his glory. Let's go. Let's pray. To be faithful on mission, Jesus, you've made it so clear. The church must partner together in mission. Lord, I pray this church, you would be mobilizing us as individuals, as families, corporately together as a family for the mission of Jesus Christ, stealing up our resolve and conviction to declare one message only, to be grounded one gospel, one gospel. There is one gospel on which we stand. There is one gospel on which we declare. Give us wisdom to know who to partner with that shares that one conviction, the pure gospel, the true gospel, getting increasingly rare to find churches who will hold to that unswervingly. Please give us wisdom, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the family of God. The church isn't perfect, but we serve a perfect Savior, a perfect head who has given this church and the universal church as a gift to us. The family of God. And Lord, as an elder of this church and the senior pastor of this church, I repent on behalf of this church and other churches around this world that have chosen instead to complain and grumble 
and be competitive? Lord, heal your church. Show us, remind us again and again and again that we truly are stronger together. Yes, there will be hard stuff. Yes, the church is filled with sinners and it will be messy sometimes, but we're, we're family. Lord, we need you. We need you to live this way. And I thank you, Jesus, that you lived this way. You never swerved from a gospel conviction and a mission conviction. You did everything perfectly, the Father asked you, and you promised you would build your church. And so right now, I pray we just take a moment to repent, Lord. Of where our lives are not showing, we're stronger together. Lord, I pray for those here whose hearts are far from you, our friends that are in this room but have yet to confess the name of Jesus. I pray you would open their eyes and soften their hearts right now to call on you as Savior. There's no other way. And for us as a church, I pray every believer in this room would look, where, where can I intentionally equip? Where can I step in to serve? To live for the mission of God over the mission of self. That you would be all to us, Jesus, and the saving love of Christ would be the measure of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, will you respond and as we sing this very powerful we sing this very powerful last song. I pray it would be an anthem. Sing it loud. That we would be known the Christ party. Maybe we'll take that to Parliament Hill, huh? The Christ party. Come on. But when that line comes, let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. You mean it? Then let's declare it loud together that we would see the hand of the Lord on this church and on lives all over this city and around this world for the glory of God. All right? Let's go. Let's stand and respond. Sing it out.